All right, so as we are working on rhetoric part two, uh, right now we're going to talk about rhetorical strategies and appeals. Make sure that you have something to write with and uh, that you're taking notes. There is a lot of information on this, and I just want to make sure that you don't miss it for our next assignments that we have to do this week. So rhetorical strategies and appeals. So rhetorical strategies first, that's what we're going to talk about first. So rhetoric is the art or study of effective language. Effective language is language that's used to create an effect. This includes writing uh, that has been created to accomplish the writer's goal. Uh, the writer's goal was to communicate a specific idea. So it is how they are, it is the goal and then how they are using the words to reach that goal. Therefore, rhetoric may be described as, quote, persuasive use of language and rhetorical strategies are techniques by which writers persuade readers. So think about what are some of the uh, techniques by which you know, some people use language persuasively. Maybe you have certain friends that you might be thinking of now or times where you have used um, language persuasively. So maybe you thought of some of these examples. Um, sometimes people use the following techniques to help verbally persuade. So formal diction, that's one. Um, it leads readers to believe something is ethically or legally important. Emotional diction, it's also sometimes called sensationalism, leads readers to recognize that the ideas expressed are important. Illusion or direct reference to a noteworthy source can associate a new idea to a traditionally respected source. Adoption of another person's language or style can either demonstrate a respect for or a disrespect for another writer. So let's look at formal diction first. So if you are trying to persuade a restaurant worker to wear gloves, you might say to that person, it is the policy of the Georgia, Re Georgia Restaurant Association for all employees to wear gloves. Those words are persuasive because they sound formal and authoritative. Emotional appeal. Emotionally words, they are or emotional words, they are loaded words um, and they can demonstrate a writer's intense feeling. So for example, if you wish to demonstrate how much you liked a movie, you could say, it was the most awe-inspiring display of artistry ever presented on the big screen. Even if it weren't for my tone when how I was reading it, um, you know, the key words in there, if you look at awe-inspiring and display of artistry, ever presented. All of those are words that evoke a emotional feeling, a very a strong sense of importance, and you can just feel the uh, intensity there. Illusion or reference. This is a strong principle that is used in advertising. So people can people connect people and ideas through juxtaposition. So if I want to convince you to wash your hands, I may say, thou shalt wash thy hands. This connects the idea of washing one's hands to commandments. Uh, many people respect commandments. Therefore, those people may begin to associate hand washing with the same reverence. So, but this can also be used as something that may be funny. So there are different ways that you could um, use that. Humor, so uh, humor can be used in very persuasive ways, just like in that last slide. 
Um, it can be used to win you over or to make you like the writer and therefore you'll like their ideas because you know, sometimes if you don't like a writer, you are not going to like their ideas and or vice versa. So that is a part of human nature. Sometimes you can separate the two, but uh, it's just it's pretty common. So humor comes in many forms. So hyperbole or exaggeration. Understatement. Irony, verbal, situational, dramatic, cosmic. And sarcasm. Other rhetorical tactics. So some people may be persuasive by using some of these techniques. So a numeratio, this is listing or numbering ideas. Uh, this is a logical presentation of information that can be convincing because of its strong organization. Uh, just don't do it like Kevin's brother on Home Alone when he says, uh, you know, number one, and then he lists some whatever his issue was. And then B, and then, you know, he just goes all off track on his on his enumerating his points. Uh, the next uh, point for me is anticipation of opposition. So some people may present very convincing arguments that are structured in contrast to what the opposition is likely to think or head. So with this, the person, the uh, the author or the speaker they are thinking ahead before they even voice their argument. They're thinking ahead of what the opposition is going to say. So say you are 12 years old and you want a puppy and you're going to ask your parents for a puppy. You're going to think ahead. Okay, they're going to ask about, well, what about my goldfish that died? And you know, who's going to train it? Who's going to feed it? Blah, blah. You're going to go through all that list of stuff. And then you're going to, whenever you go to talk to them, you're already going to address them before they even get to it. So you're already structuring your argument around that. Attitude, tone, and mood. So these three literary terms are essentially the same thing. Uh, you can think of an ATM to help you remember them. Um, attitude, tone, mood, ATM. Uh, they are by definition the emotional feelings that come from a chosen diction. Sometimes you can tell the emotional state of the writer or the writing by examining the individual words that the writer uses. Writers who choose diction as a means to contribute to tone are using tone as a rhetorical technique. So sometimes you can say, you know, someone might note your tone. Maybe you have an angry tone. So that is by how you sound. But attitude, tone, and mood can also be um, conveyed through the words chosen, not with necessarily hearing the words. So think about yourself. Take a minute and think about what rhetorical strategies do you use most frequently to persuade readers or even just to people that you speak to? And what rhetorical strategies do you find most persuasive when others use them on you? Some rhetorical strategies are generally more persuasive than others, but often the audience and the circumstances can affect the persuasiveness of that strategy. So for example, if you want to persuade the pastor of a church to plan church outing, are you likely to get far with invective or do you think you should use some satire uh, as a persuasive strategy for a job interview? Like, you, you know, you need to think about which, um, rhetorical strategies are suitable for which situation and for which person. Um, you know, for sarcasm being one of the ones that we noted earlier, um, some of you might be a fan of sarcasm. A lot of people like sarcasm, but you also have to be careful of when that is appropriate to use because it might come across as rude, right? Or there might be people who 
they don't like sarcasm, it might rub them the wrong way in some shape or form. So it's not a one size fits all for each strategy, uh, for each situation or for each um, person in your audience. So let's look at this uh, case study. It's called Magic Show. So read this argument carefully, and as I go, write down the rhetorical techniques that you may notice. Uh, if you don't remember the name um, of one that we just talked about and it's one that you're not familiar with, that's totally fine. Uh, but just make some kind of note um, that you recognized what it was, maybe a characteristic of it. So Ralph wants to go to a magic show. His mom wants him to stay at home and clean out the frog cage. And we'll just go through the uh, conversation here. So Ralph, hello, my gorgeous mother. Please, please, please take us to the magic show. His mother, no, I will not. Please, please, please take you to the magic show. I won't even take you to the dentist. You need to go clean out the frog cage. I'm incredibly disappointed in your neglect. Now go in there and do it. Ralph, but I can do that in the morning, mom. You know what Benjamin Franklin says, plow deep while sluggard sleep. His mother, I am not going to pay $100 for you to disappear. Now get in there and deal with the frog. End of the argument. Are you sad that Ralph didn't get to go? Or would you rather it didn't like this? Ralph, I would love to take you and all of your friends to the magic show. Let's leave right now and take extra spending money. So in that conversation and with the alternate ending, um, did you notice someone's use of humor as a persuasive tactic? Did you notice any diction designed to express a particular emotion or to present an overall tone? Who made an illusion? And was it persuasive? Who used the hyperbole? And what about the reductionist tactic? Um, can you find someone's attempt to reduce the other person's argument? So I want you to, on your own, take um, all of this a step further. And we're not going to do it now, but these are things I want you to do outside of the class time and just get an idea for um, very good examples of rhetorical strategies that were used in famous texts and speeches. Um, and maybe you can see that significant influence that rhetorical strategies have. So the first one being Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. He uses a lot of metaphor. And also if you see one of these things that they use and you really like that kind of uh, rhetorical strategy, you know, look at the example I give you and then go through and just kind of analyze how that author used it. So if you really are a big fan of metaphor, check out his speech, go through it, see how he used it. The next one is Patrick Henry's speech at the Virginia Convention. Um, that speech has a lot of great organization and powerful diction. And that is where the quote, give me liberty or give me death comes from. Abe Lincoln's The Gettysburg Address. He has a lot of parallelism and repetition. Chief Seattle's speech has great rhetorical questioning. How can you buy or sell the warmth of the land? Where's the thicket and where's the eagle? So 
So now let's look at rhetorical appeals. So the three rhetorical appeals as discussed by Aristotle are ethos, pathos, and logos. These three appeals are guided by Kairos, which is about timing. The three appeals may be used alone, but arguments are most effective when they combine the three appeals and they are strongly grounded in Kairos or grounded in the timing. So let's look at ethos first or if you're British, it's ethos. So ethos, it's a Greek word for character. Ethos is an appeal to character, especially authority and expertise. Ethos is often mistaken as an appeal to ethics. Though ethics are an aspect of a person's organization, ethos, um, an organization's ethos, ethics are not the only component of a character's authority or expertise. So it's not only about the ethics, but it is kind of a hand, it is an aspect, it's a piece of it, like a puzzle piece. Um, and it's a handy way to remember um, ethics often ties with people or organization and it's an aspect of their authority and um, how they are represented and usually in a positive way. So the ethos, um, it goes directly to that. What is the, um, the appeal, the stance, the character, authority, all of that of the, um, the speaker or whoever the um, piece is about. So celebrity endorsements. Um, that is a big example of that. So think about all the celebrities that wear different things, um, or maybe they are a popular musician, hello Kanye, and then they delved into, you know, designing fashion. Um, pretty sure dude does not have a background in fashion, um, but his popularity in combination with his wife's uh, that definitely bolsters the drive for people to want things from his brand. The same thing with, um, you know, Taylor Swift with CoverGirl and Eva Longoria with, uh, I think it's Garnier or L'Oreal here. I can't remember which, but so those are all examples of celebrities. They might not be, uh, aficionados in that area, but they have garnered a lot of respect and credibility. So that is what makes those advertisements effective. Ethos is why the American Dental Association endorsement of a toothpaste is more powerful and generally holds more sway than an endorsement from a non-medical professional. At the same time, though, um, it also relates advertise it how it relates to advertising is a bit complex. Sometimes people organizations will have strong ethos, not because they are professionals in a field like dentistry, but because they demonstrate the ideal results or benefits of a product. So here are some examples of ethos. So, Sofia Vergara, for example, uh, she's a popular actress um, on Modern Family. So her ethos as one of the world's most beautiful people makes her an especially useful spokesperson for an array of personal care products. In part because she is now she's known not only as an actor but also because she's attractive. So it's no surprise that she is a spokesperson for a variety of cosmetic and personal products. So from CoverGirl to Head and Shoulder Shampoo. So 
So the latter pro product, the head and shoulders, so that is really where her ethos is visible. So by having her star in the commercials, um, she's not only admitting that her family has been using head and shoulders for over 20 years, uh, the company relies on her ethos as a confident and beautiful woman to combat embarrassment that some people may have if they have dandruff or a flaky scalp and then they need a Medicaid shampoo. So basically she's coming out and saying, hey, I deal with this too and look at me, I'm you know, a pretty movie star, blah, blah, blah. And if I can deal with it, it's okay if you deal with it too. So it really adds not only a comfort aspect to people um, who may want to buy that, but it also shows her as an authority in someone who has not only used that, but um, understands where, you know, the background and in dealing with something like that. So her emphasis on how long her family has used head and shoulders even suggests that uh, some of her success is due to that. So it's like, you know, I use head and shoulders and I look beautiful, so you should use it too. And you'll have hair like me kind of thing. So pathos. Um, pathos originally um, is describes uh, appeals to audiences sensibilities. Modern uses generally means an appeal to emotions, which can be both positive or negative. A writer may appeal to emotions that an audience already has about a subject or um, the writer may just elicit the emotions, may draw them out. So as far as remembering this one, I think of like empathy. So empathy has to deal with how you feel about something um, and it's emotional. So that is a good way to, uh, to remember pathos. So here's a quote from Aristotle. He said, the emotions are all those feelings that so change men as to affect their judgments and that are also attended by pain or pleasure. Such are anger, pity, fear, and the like with their opposites. We must arrange what we have to say about each of them under three heads. Take, for instance, the emotion of anger. Here, we must discover, one, what the state of mind of angry people is. Two, who the people are with whom they usually get angry, and three, on what grounds they get angry with them. As Aristotle argues, emotions are central to our decision making, so even if we're not totally aware of it. So if a, if a writer desires to persuade a particular audience, then they have to understand the ruling emotions around that topic and from that audience. So what makes the audience angry or happy? Who or what is involved in producing or evoking that emotional state? Why does that particular audience become angry or happy with a specific context? So knowing those answers um, to those questions can help you prepare an argument and provide basis for developing evidence and identifying counter arguments ahead of time. Pathos appeals can sometimes be overwhelming and they can dominate an argument um, because emotions can be overwhelming. Um, when emotions are really strong, they can take overtake logic and reason. So um, that is something, you know, specific, I mean, if you think about during election season, for example, um, that is a big component of a lot of debates or ads is just honing directly in on that emotional appeal and to 
have people think through their emotions versus necessarily through uh, logic and reason. So an example of pathos, political campaigns. They are excellent examples. Um, political ads often play on the fears and hopes of different demographics. So for example, a political ad focused on retired and elderly voters may claim that a candidate plans on eliminating social support programs like Medicare or will drastically cut social security benefits. These types of ads don't need to contain facts or evidence um, for those kinds of actions to be useful or to be successful because they're relying on the fears and worries of that intended audience that already has a, already has the finances and medical security on their minds. So remember that pathos is about the emotional state of the audience, not about the rhetor. So this is where you are thinking about the audience, your reader, how, what their emotional state will be, um, not yours. So, because you want your goal to be achieved and you've already convinced yourself of whatever it is your goal is, so your job is to convince them. Logos. So, Logos is an appeal to logical reason. Logos is about the clarity, consistency, and soundness of an argument from the premise and structure to the evidence and the support. A writer appeals to Logos by making reasonable claims and supporting those claims with evidence, such as statistics and other data and facts. However, um, logical and reasonable arguments and evidence are not universal across audiences, contexts, cultures, times, etc. So what an audience considers reasonable claims and adequate evidence is influenced by their values and their beliefs. Um, also, data and facts can change over time as we obtain more evidence and information and data. So an example of logos. Uh, some people believe that the FDA is part of a conspiracy to cover up evidence that common vaccines cause a variety of neurological, psychological, and physical disorders. Despite extensive scientific evidence from around the world that demonstrates common vaccines are safe, the scientific evidence is not reasonable or logical and therefore not persuasive for the conspiracy audience because the evidence may come from manufacturers or vac of vaccines, FDA-sponsored studies, or researchers of or studies with that or that have connections to the FDA or other government agencies. However, for other audience, such as those who are simply unsure about the actual benefits or reasons for vaccines, the same studies and data might be quite persuasive. So once again, it depends on your audience. Kairos. So Kairos is the Greek word for time. Um, in Greek mythology, Kairos was the youngest son of Zeus. Um, in rhetoric, Kairos refers to an opportune moment or appropriateness for persuading a particular audience about a particular subject. Kairos depends on a strong awareness of a rhetorical situation. And Kairos is also where, why, and when of persuasion. So it's like a right place, right time kind of thing. So for example, nearly all op-eds and political essays are chaotic. The writers work to relate their ideas and messages to whatever is happening in the news and in popular culture. So think about what's going on right now with um, the current presidential campaign season. So the ads that you're seeing right now 
have to do with the COVID pandemic or how things, um, you know, unemployment right now, it, all of the issues that are present right now, those are what is taking front and center um, in this campaign season. And, you know, when the debates come around, um, those will take front and center because those are what, that is what our present is. That is what is forefront of people's mind. Um, so 10 years ago during a debate, I am sure discussing pandemic uh, issues and how to tackle if we got a pandemic, that would not have been at the forefront of people's minds.